I'm joined today by Amos Camille, playwright, screenwriter, investigative reporter. His 2012 cover story in the New York Times Magazine brought the Horace Mann scandal to light. He graduated from Horace Mann School in 1982. Amos, it's so great to talk to you. Let's start at the beginning. What is the Horace Mann School for people who aren't familiar with it? Sure. Uh, Horace Mann sort of plays on a big stage in uh, American educational history. It's uh, perennially, perennially voted one of the top 10 schools uh, in the country by Forbes. It's an elite private school in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. And uh, really, the 1% have always sent their kids to uh, HM. And uh, today, it's more like the 1% of the 1%. And I, I was lucky enough to get a, a scholarship there when I was uh, a sophomore. I was a good baseball player, and I was recruited to go there. So uh, uh, at the time, they had a lot of middle-class kids there as well. And in the Boston area, it's probably like the Milton School or something like that. So. And you graduated in 1982, and you broke the story in a New York tar Times article about just the, the rampant sexual abuse in 2012. How did you decide on the timing of that? That's right. So it, it was a slow process. Uh, essentially, uh, we had known that there were, uh, I wouldn't say abusers, but uh, at the time, in the, in the language of a 15-year-old, teachers acting strange or stay away from this one, stay away from that one, those kind of whispers. Hmm. And uh, both boys and girls at the school, the, the school went co-ed in 75. We would talk pretty openly about which teachers to avoid. And then about 10 years later, after I graduated, I went camping with, uh, there were five of us, and we went camping. And one night, a guy that I call Andrew in the book told us that he had been uh, abused by a very popular football coach named Mark Wright. And what happened after that was we went around the campfire telling different stories about drinking with teachers, about uh, rumors, uh, a couple of cover stories uh, came out that night. And then we went on with our lives. And about, it was literally tw 20 years later, uh, the Sandusky uh, trial hit, and he was everywhere, Penn State. And I called Andrew and I asked him how he was doing, and he said, I'm not doing too well. I wish somebody would write about it. And that, as you suggest, uh, ultimately became uh, Prep School Predators, which was the cover story uh, of the Times Magazine in June of 2012. And what's your understanding now of how many people were, well, I guess the two sides to the question, how many teachers and staff were abusing students and also how many students were abused? At the time that we published uh, in, in the, uh, that I published the piece in the Times, we, I had accused credibly three teachers uh, of abuse. What happened in the wake of the article was really just a tsunami of uh, credible accusations. And now, sadly, we're up to 22 abusers at Horace Mann, not victims. Victims were probably, uh, uh, 32 have come forward, entered into a very difficult mediation process with the school. But we know there's many more out there. But that's why we wrote, uh, we wrote Great is the Truth. It was really... The, the number, you know, to date, it's the, it's the largest recorded uh, concentration of uh, sexual abusers in one institution in American educational history. And uh, we knew it was bad. We didn't know it was uh, quite this bad. It was sort of a you know, Catholic school bad, as somebody said, Catholic church bad. And we know about sexual abuse being drastically underreported in part. Often there's like a power dynamics sort of situation that prevents victims from from feeling comfortable reporting it. Sometimes it's an issue of, of shame. What's your sense of why at Horace Mann School there were not reports about what was going on? Well, at, at the time, uh, I thought uh, that there weren't reports. We now know that uh, several people actually did come forward. And there's a whole range. I mean, the, the abuse at Horace Mann was so widespread spread that there's a large spectrum uh, of ways to answer that, that specific question. Some people, like many victims, just sort of sealed it away and said, I don't want to ever talk about this. Uh, many labored under uh, the impression for decades that they were the only one hmm. uh, that it had happened to. Uh, some teachers uh, and administrators covered it up. Others didn't know. So the power dynamic, um, not just at Horace Mann, at other places too, is really what helps seal in the silence. 
So for instance, if a kid is abused, boy or girl, one of the acts that the teacher, uh, the, the adult does is they, they make the child complicit in the act. Right. Right. So they think that it's, uh, it's mutual. And you know, when you have a 40-year-old and a 15-year-old, it's not mutual. There's a power dynamic there. So they start silence, uh, silencing themselves. Then, many years later, if they actually come forward, oftentimes they're not believed, and so they learn to stuff it even more. And the, the legal system, quite frankly, uh, New, York, uh, New York is where Horace Mann is, has an unbelievably strict statute of limitations law. So a child uh, has only until, a person who has been abused has only until the age of 23 to come forward in both uh, civil and criminal cases. And we know that most people, if they ever talk about it, only do so when they're in their 40s or 50s, 42 being the average. And as you talked about, there's this sort of mediation process that has been going on. There have been some settlements offered by the school. Some people have accepted settlements. Not everybody has. Do you have any sense as to the size of some of these individual settlements that were reached? Well, because Horace Mann didn't really, uh, most of the, ish, the uh, cases of abuse were well past uh, the age of 23. Right. Horace Mann uh, took a very hardball position. And as I said, 32 people came forward. And they took the position that we don't owe you anything. So what, whatever you get is going to be out of the goodness of our own hearts. And many of these people, you have to remember, this is some, among some of the wealthiest people on the planet. Uh, who sit on Horace Mann's board, billionaire, hedge fund uh, folks, and real estate people. So if uh, a victim's uh, uh, legal counsel was asking for a million dollars or two million dollars, Horace Mann would counter with something along the lines of five or ten thousand dollars. Wow. And for some people, they understood it was a negotiation. Others started talking about re being re-traumatized uh, by that hardball uh, position. Uh, and certainly didn't lead to uh, healing. And is that, I mean, I know you've said you've had feelings of guilt for sort of opening this Pandora's box with the 2012 New York Times article. Does this re-traumatization that you're talking about play a role in why you've had feelings of guilt? Or talk about that a little bit. Sure. You know, at the time when uh, those of us who were not uh, abused and were sort of inner circle watching uh, and hearing what was coming back from the mediation process, I, I started to question what good it was all doing. And I, I've, th I've since changed, but I had moments of doubt and also moments of doubt of just all of the, the, the sort of poison coming out. And, um, you know, I started to really understand why people keep silent for so long. It was just so horrible what was coming out. And really why, you know, why I wrote Great is the Truth is really because not, not what happened in the past, right? We can't really fix that. But what, how Horace Mann, uh, its current administration, reacted in the present. There's a way, mo most victims don't come forward looking for money. They don't really have the strength to do so, many of them. They're looking usually for two things. One, for somebody to acknowledge that what happened to them actually happened to them. Mm -hmm. And two, from somebody from the institution to actually apologize. So that didn't, uh, it happened in a very lawyered up way in the Horace Mann case. And um, although some people, I don't want to speak for everybody, some people are uh, pleased that they've been able to move on with their lives, many, many, many of the victims and many of us watching from the outer circle uh, are saying, Horace, we thought our school was better than that. And uh, the, the, the name of the book, Great is the Truth, is the motto of the school. So that just sort of added insult to injury. Last thing I want to touch on in the limited time we have left, what's your sure. sense of how much school administrators knew at the time of what was going on? My sense is that they knew, uh, not all of them, but they knew there were, uh, as new headmasters came, uh, came aboard, uh, they were told, certainly some of the board members knew, certainly some of the teachers knew, uh, knew uh, in terms of, because uh, students had either come to them uh, or their, their kids had told them. Uh, in some cases, uh, teachers actually went to administrators. So I definitely assumed that everybody knew, all the teachers knew at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I've softened a little, but many adults who were there at the time, and remember, 
The abuse happened from 1962 into the late 90s, 96 uh, being the latest uh, that we know of. So that's an extraordinary long period for people to know about all of this abuse going on. Uh, and it's a tiny campus. There's, you know, 600 people at Horace Mann at the, uh, every, any given time. So people definitely knew. I'll remind everybody the book is Great is the Truth, Secrecy, Scandal and the Quest for Justice at the Horace Mann School. We've been speaking with the book's author, Amos Camille. Thanks so much for being here and telling us the story. I really appreciate it, David.